I've been very good at seeing the curve. The, the key is AI is everywhere. It's not whether you use AI, it's whether you use it differently than everyone else. Today will inspire you to get into innovation and adaptation in our two-part series with John McElligot. John shares his story from combat engineer to tech entrepreneur. I became amazed at what humans and machines together could create. Machines that could operate other machines. It was astonishing to me. I started to talk very heavily about robots and AI because I knew it was coming. I was like, oh man, it's starting to happen. Like the curve's coming. I'm now I'm riding the way. Revealing the strategies that transform challenges into opportunities. So through my speaking engagements, that's what I used to seed fund my company. Two years go by, I land my first million dollar contract and then I go back to my old investors and in an afternoon raise about four and a half million. You will learn why adapting to new technologies is essential for transforming industries and improving communities. There was something I read recently, 85% of people know what artificial intelligence is, but something like 5% of them have used it. And so, welcome to the High Performance CEO Show. John, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you, Sebastian, for having me on. I appreciate the flexibility and the jumping around a little bit, but I'm super pumped to be doing this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. We had a pre-call and I was really inspired by the opportunity to have you on the show. One thing, looking at your profile on LinkedIn, I have to disagree on one small part. What's that? You said change is coming. I know. I, say I, need change. To, I, I, I said change is there. I know. I need to update it. It's like, it's, I remember when I created it, that was, that was the big thing. It was like nine years ago when I was really heavily focused on like AI and robotics and this is coming, it's coming. Yeah. So I need to, I think yeah. just, just like the change has come and it's gone <laughs> and now this craziness is happening. Yeah, we just uh, talked that, that as you record this, this week, figure one has been released yeah, or has been made public show to the world. Chat GPT robot, which is basically speaking to you. It replies to your orders. It can make decisions and uh, pretty crazy. And I mean, you are the man of robots. Yeah, that's your profession. And so this episode, we want to talk a lot about robots and how they will change the world or already changing the world. But before we go into this, I mean, you have such an amazing story and you probably told it many times, but it really inspired me last time when we had a pre-call. So how did you got to where you are right now? Yeah. So I'll give, I guess, a little bit of my background. So currently I live in a, a little town in Pennsylvania called York, Pennsylvania. If you've ever had a peppermint patty or any of your listeners have ever had one, it's kind of like our claim to fame. Also first capital of the United States. The Articles of Confederation were actually drafted up the street from my house. We're a major player in World War II. There was a plan that came out of our town, and I can talk a little bit about that later, called the York Plan that ended up getting adopted by the whole, uh -huh. the whole nation. But typical Rust Belt town, like former manufacturing, still a lot of manufacturing here. But we used to be this manufacturing powerhouse, and like a lot of small towns in the United States, we're a part of the Rust Belt. Luckily, though, for us, though, so we do have a lot of advanced manufacturing here. And because Pittsburgh is in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of robotics and AI out of Carnegie Mellon and the National Robotics and Engineering Center. But originally, I'm actually from Springfield, Massachusetts. And when I was eight, my family decided to become uh, missionaries. So I actually grew up in the United Kingdom. So my dad started churches in England, Ireland, and Scotland. I came back when I was 18 to go to school. So I came back. I went to college in the United States. I ended up joining the Marines as a combat engineer. So like... Combat engineers do like seven different things, but my specialty was breaching and explosives. So that's kind of where I learned engineering, but I mostly just blew things up. I did get married very young, not married anymore. And all I ever really wanted to, to be was in the military. So I was focused very heavy on, I wanted, I was in the Marines. I was going to do a lap move over because the, the Navy, it's actually, the Marines is a division of the Navy. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And I like jumping out of planes and blowing things up. And my wife at the time did not want that life. And so I decided to give it up. It. Go ahead. It's a tough, tough training, Navy SEALs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I read some articles and saw a video, couple of videos. So kind of big, big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, and so that was part of my thinking was like, okay, if I join the Marines first yeah. and then I transfer into the SEALs, I'll at least have like kind of that mm. good solid base. And, but, you know, I honestly, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life at that point. That's pretty much all I, I wanted to do. And the other side of my personality, though, was music. So actually, I can sing and play different instruments and write songs. And I'd never really thought about it as a like a, a real career move. But as a Marine, I have a, a pretty big part of me is in planning. And so I thought, all right, I'll work a job loosely related to what I went to school for. I went to school for criminal justice. And I'll work as many hours of overtime as I could. And half the money is going to go into a bank account for a day that I'm going to quit my job. I put it on a calendar. I worked right up to that day. I walked into work. I'm like, you're a jerk. You're a jerk. You're cool. You're a jerk. I'm out. <laughs> I haven't had to work for anybody since. It's been like 20 years, 20 plus years. The other thing though, so my ex-wife was actually a former model. 
And in the modeling world, one of three things typically happens to models. They either age out completely and then end up not getting any more work. They do very, very well and kind of become famous and get into acting and different stuff. Or they very often become photographers. And right at this time period, it was kind of like at the very beginning of digital. So all of the most successful photographers were just like old white dudes. And because I'm a big researcher, like the idea was that as we live off my savings and I'm touring, we'll build another business, which was the photography business. And that would begin to take over for our income. Now, I didn't know anything about photography. I actually didn't know anything about business. Like I didn't go to school for business. I was in the military. It was very hierarchical, um, very structured. And so I thought, all right, well, I've got to figure out like what makes a successful photography business. So I actually started talking to some of these older photographers and they were all telling me like, oh, well, it's this and you've got to have an eye and it's natural talent. And I went to this school and that. And when it came down to it, I was like, the thing that's made you successful is just time because they would shoot and then they would send stuff in to get developed or they'd have a dark room. They develop it themselves oh. and then they would get better. And so when I started yeah. talking to them about digital, at the time it was very grainy. It was very expensive. They were like, oh, this is never going to take off. People are never going to want it. But I saw the value in the digital is not, not in the image quality. It was the immediate feedback. You could, sh exactly. yeah, you could shoot lifetimes worth. And so that's what I did. The other half went into buying a bunch of digital. Fast forward several years. Things are, are going great. We're in New York. We're thinking we're going to get signed. We're working with some pretty big labels. And then all of a sudden, all the original acts got canned. And this was like right around the time that the music industry was trying to figure out like how to handle Napster and streaming and all this other stuff. And instead of embracing the innovation, they, the way they responded was create American Idol. And so it was like right when that was created, all the original acts were gotten rid of and then everything started getting prepackaged. So uh, again, there's another big upheaval in my life, not knowing what I was going to do next. Thought about going back into the military. There's for a very short period of time, I actually was training to, to become a SEAL. And I thought this, I can't do this. Like the Marines did a number on my body. I don't want to be the guy in Afghanistan or Iraq. That's kind of the liability. I well. step on a rock wrong or something. And so I actually ended up shooting like weddings and photography with my ex-wife. So we started running the business together. I modified all my rifle slings and stuff like that to hold cameras instead of rifles. I would rappel and free climb from buildings and bridges. I did it very often for like architectural firms of the state and they paid a lot of money. It's like 25 grand a day. This was all pre-drone. Mm -hmm. So we were actually doing very well. I mean, we were making more money than we could actually spend. It was just me, my ex-wife, and we had one assistant, and our profit margins were massive. It was a lot of fun. It turns out I was actually a really good photographer. We started winning a lot of awards, and everything was going great. This was right around the time period when it was trendy for husband and wife teams, and the first generation looked kind of like rock star mm. photographers. Like, we all looked like we were in bands and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of new photographers pop up out of nowhere. Like just everywhere. It's like they came out of the woodwork. And so a bunch of us got together in Lancaster, which is a town not too far from where I am, at one of the bars downtown. And it turns out what was happening was there was a whole new generation of photographers that were buying like Canon Rebels and cheap Nikon cameras. And basically all the expensive algorithms that were on our equipment was now all getting put on prosumer equipment. And these guys were learning how to do stuff on YouTube, throwing up websites that cost next to nothing, and then actually shooting for free to build their portfolio. So we're all starting to panic, right? And try and figure out like, well, how do we stop this? And, and the one person says, well, why don't we pull all our money? We'll create a co-op. And then that way we can pull all our marketing power and we can refer each other. And the next person said, and they actually did this. They said, well, why don't we go online and pretend to be their clients and rate them bad? So you have people I'm like <laughs> professionals on Yelp, but I had to show up to my wedding drunk. Like just crazy stuff. Oh. And it, it got around to me and I'm like, Oh no, we're the music industry trying to stop the iPod. You know, like yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, thinking, exactly. where the people <laughs> we put under. And so at that point, I was like, well, I guess this ride's over because I knew that like I couldn't stop this any more than the guys yeah. we put out could stop it or the music exactly. industry. And so I thought, all right, well, this isn't going away. So instead of fighting this new generation, I needed to find a way to help them. And that was my philosophy was like, all right, the one thing they're getting very good at the art piece of it, but they're not making money. Like they're not figuring out the business side. And I was very good at that. So that's why I created my first tech startup. So it essentially started kind of in the photography space and then began to branch off into like bands that had built their own recording studios that had all this recording equipment and people that were becoming videographers and stay at home moms. So it was like kind of squarely focused, not on professionals, not on amateurs, but this prosumer, this middle ground of people that were getting very, very good, but they didn't know how to make money at it. And so I didn't know anything about tech. So I started going to, there happened to be like a founders meeting up in Lancaster. There were a couple of guys that lived there that had, had some pretty significant exits, came back, wanted to create like a kind of a tech ecosystem. 
And um, me going in, I, I had no idea what I was doing, but I had built a minimum viable product and it was working. And so I had a chance to explain to them what it was doing. And so they actually ended up joining my board and were really excited because it like people were actually using this thing that I built. And so they were like, all right, it's time to raise money. And I was like, well, I've never raised money to do anything before. It's a brand new world. And they said, all right, well, you got to go to San Francisco, got to go to New York. I'm like, all right, if that's what I'm supposed to do, then that's what I'll do. So I'm out in the Valley, I'm in Silicon Alley, and I'm pitching to some of like the early investors in Facebook, like some pretty big names in the VC world. And they're all saying the same thing. They're like, totally get it. My daughter is getting into photography. I had a band when I was in high school. I'd love to be able to like record an album and a video. And but they all said, there's no way we're going to invest in you in York, Pennsylvania. Like, we don't know where that is. It's the middle of nowhere. You're not going to get talent. It's still US. So. <laughs> right, right. I mean, but if, if you've ever spent time in the Valley, that was, especially during this time period, that was very mm. common. Like that thinking, like everything tech, all tech was built here. And it, in a lot of ways it was, all the money was there. And, but I was actually very committed to the community I lived in. So growing up in a missionary family, we moved around a lot. I didn't really ever feel connected to anywhere that I lived. So I made the decision that when I moved to York, I was going to make it my home. And I was going to do everything I could to try and help it. Like when I moved there, empty storefronts, it was, you know, old typical Rust Belt manufacturing town. And so I was committed to building this technology company in York. I had a philosophy, and I still think it's true, that in the first and second industrial revolutions, the towns like York did great. There were young entrepreneurs that were embracing the steam engine. And then as they grew their businesses, then they began to see electricity and they were maturing and getting older. So they embraced that technology. And all of a sudden, their businesses were exploding. Something interesting happened, though, in the third industrial revolution. I've seen the same pattern all across the United States is the people that started the companies were then retiring and giving the companies to their kids. And they went from risk takers to caretakers. And that, that some switch flipped because all the little towns used to be innovative, industrial, like really embracing new machines and new methodology. And then all of a sudden, that leadership versus stewardship is so different. And all of a sudden, new technologies all became threats. And so everything kind of became clamped down. Now, I saw this happen and I was convinced that like, okay, so what's about to come next is going to make this other stuff pale in comparison to it. So somebody has to do like be the first, like the archetype here in our town. And so that was my goal. I wanted to be the first funded tech startup there. So I came back to York. I was actually really bummed out because I was very committed. I wasn't going to move. And I thought, all right, I didn't need to raise a ton of money. It was like a quarter of a million dollars or something like that. And I thought, all right, there's got to be a way for me to raise money here. So while our town was very impoverished and there weren't a lot of businesses downtown, our baseball stadium, we, we got a baseball stadium built by the community, like $25 million, all funded from within the community. Market View Arts, like this art gallery goes up, $16 million, all funded within the community. I'm like, where the heck is all this money coming from? Because our town is like decimated, but there's these pockets of all this money. So I did research and I found that for a town, we were like three square miles. We had like two billionaire families and lots and lots of old money in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, just sitting on the sidelines, but doing things like that. And so I thought, all right, well, I'll just talk to those guys. And not being from York, I would give the pitch to my company, trying to get to some of these powerful people. And in response, it was almost like everything that I said didn't matter. People responded with two questions. The first is, where'd you go to high school and who are your parents? And I was like, what does yeah. that have to do with anything that I just told you? You're not part of the family. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, you figure because uh, York was like first capital of the United States. I mean, old United States. Some of these families have been yeah. here for generation upon generation upon generation. So, and where you went to high school determined your social cast. So like some schools were better than others. And I'm just out of pure frustration. I'm like, man, what is going on here? Like, how am I going to get to these guys? So what I did was I, I Googled all the most powerful people in town. And then do you remember the app Foursquare, like the check-in app? Yeah, yeah. So what I did was I Googled all the most powerful people in town. And then I Googled every cause they cared about, everyone they'd hired over the last, like in leadership positions over the last 30 years, who those people's kids were, their grandkids, like, and I built this big matrix of like people mm -hmm. I wanted to get to and how I was going to get to them through like all these different people. And then I took the map of Foursquare and I blew it up really big so I could figure out where everyone would go on a daily basis. And for six months, I ran from place to place, getting there like five minutes before. Sometimes my friends would be there dressed up as investors. And as soon as they'd walk in the door, my friends would go, this seems like an incredible investment opportunity. Like monocle falls out of their <laughs> eye. But other times I just have my phone and I'd be like, oh yeah, we're at this many users. There wouldn't be anyone on the other end. I'd be pitching to like nobody. It was all true. I, I never lied. I was just loud. 
I didn't lie. I was just loud. And if it didn't happen the first time, by the second or third, they'd come over and go, I hate to interrupt, but you got to meet my grandpa. So I found myself sitting in front of all of the most powerful people in town. They started writing checks. Like, it was nuts. I ended up raising about a half a million dollars. Amazing idea. Yeah, it was, again, I've been very good at seeing the curve. The, the key is, especially, and we can get into it a little bit later, because now that AI is everywhere, it's not whether you use AI, it's whether you use it differently than everyone else. In, in an age where it used to be like knowledge is power, and it's like you can Google anything. And knowledge is about to change. It's secret knowledge. Like if you're using it differently, like you're using it in ways that are unexpected, then you can do like the kind of like social hacking that I did. Now, it was really interesting because while everybody else was trying to keep me out, the people at the top wanted me to succeed. And it was interesting because I think they've been being told things that they wanted to hear over and over. But then the reality of looking around the town, it was like, all right, I put all this money into this thing and you said it was going to change downtown. It didn't change downtown. What's happening? And I started to realize that this hierarchy was built in a way where people didn't want to lead. They were waiting to take their turn. Like we didn't have leaders. We had replacements. And so the people that were right below the top were like, okay, all we got to do is just keep the boat going. And so I was seen as something that was risky because I was unproven. I'm not from York. Nobody really understood anything about technology. So I ended up, we built this product. It was actually, I was doing pretty well, but again, I hit that ceiling. I was overpaying for talent. I couldn't get the talent I needed. I couldn't raise a Series A. A lot of the stuff that I was told was actually true. My business partner at the time ended up, he ended up leaving. Like we had like no money left. I mean, it was a really crazy time. And honestly, it drove a little bit of a wedge even in my marriage because the professional photography business was still running while I was trying to help what my ex-wife saw as our competition. And so I made all the first time entrepreneur kind of mistakes, became obsessed like really laser focused, ignored everything else around me. But I ended up actually having a sunset that company. It was probably the hardest thing that I ever did. And there's other pivots and things that I did, but ultimately it wasn't going to do the thing that I wanted it to do. And in York, you don't fail and get a second chance. Like we're a German Dutch mm -hmm. honor culture. This is not like a okay. fail fast, fail. You fail and you're done. Yeah, this is like, there is no fail forward. There's fail, get out. You know what I mean? It's like you're blacklisted. But interestingly enough, I go to my first investors, the local ones, and they go, man, we can't believe you kept going. Like they were like amazed that I just kept going and going and going. So when I sunsetted the company, they said, all right, well, when you've got another idea, come back. And like, this was not what I expected to hear. So I was like, all right, I still believe technology is the key, but it's not going to be software. Like software is like invisible. It's not going to be apps. Like York is a touch, see, feel kind of place. So I thought, all right, well, what is it we're good at? Because instead of me trying to duplicate Silicon Valley, what is it that we're actually good at that I could build off of? So I did more research, and it turned out that while a lot of manufacturing towns had collapsed, our manufacturing was actually really strong, like in York County. Like, we were building parts for, like, the Mars rover and, like, tanks, and, like, our defense, like, supply chain here was very, very good, a lot of precision equipment. So I was like, all right, well, let me learn about manufacturing. So I started going on factory tours, and I came amazed at what humans and machines together could create. Like, it was just – it was astonishing to me. But then I got very nervous because I saw the same two things. I saw an aging workforce with no kids coming in and empty machines. Mm -hmm. So I was like, if this is what we're really good at, this is going to be a major problem because this cliff is coming. So I thought, all right, what's the technology that we can use in manufacturing? I was like, robots, machines that can operate other machines. Like I thought York's good at that. We build machines. Robots are just machines. We'll understand that. Lucky for me, Pennsylvania has Pittsburgh. And so I kind of hacked my way into Carnegie Mellon and the National Robotics and Engineering Center, just wandered around campus, started knocking on doors and running into like different professors. Finally got, found myself getting invited to like see some of the stuff happening at NREC. And I was astonished because it was real goofy stuff. We talked a little bit earlier about Figure and some of these new humanoid robots. And the very early ones were all goofy and falling over. But the reality is when I started to see researchers getting really excited, they were like, yeah, you don't understand. I get that it's just going like this, but it knows what a doorknob is. And like it had just taken so long to get these robots to do anything that finally they were starting to do things. And so all the researchers, they all said the same thing. They're like, it's coming, but it's not here yet. So I knew if I went back to York and started talking about robots, I would be burnt as a witch. You know what I mean? They'd run me out of town if I, they thought I was crazy talking about the iPhone's going to be a big deal. And so like I thought if I started talking about artificial intelligence and robots, that's it. And so I thought, all right, I, I can't be talking about that stuff right now, but, you know, always had an eye on it. I was like, okay, 
it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Not right now, but it's going to happen. So I thought, all right, I got to capitalize on the fact that they're willing to give me more money. So what can I do that in the meantime, will I can get a track record of success because I didn't want that company, like the one company to be kind of the thing as I tried and it didn't work. And so I actually was like, okay, well, they like building things. And so I got into real estate. So me and two former partners started a company. We actually bought a city block to start and then all of Main Street. I mean, we, we went from doing $100,000 projects to like $30 million projects in a matter of 18 months. I mean, we grew very fast. Just from the three of us, like 100 employees. It was great too. It was a lot of fun. We had all these different businesses. I took a lot of what I learned in the tech world and I applied it to that. So it was a combination of us doing things like the lean startup combined with us not really knowing what we're doing. And so we just moved so quickly that we were outpacing every other developer. It was amazing. Like our city block on a first Friday would draw more people than the whole city. I mean, it was, it was cool too. It was like bands living on the block and playing on the roof and cops would shut us down all the time. And I mean, it was just, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. Fast forward though, about 18 months, two years into this. So at the very beginning, we'd all committed to like none of us sitting on any boards. We wanted to remain outside of the hierarchy. And something interesting happens when you've been rocking the boat and then you get asked to get in the boat you've been rocking. It was one of those things where like all of a sudden we were this unstoppable force. And once that happened, the people that were trying to stop us wanted to start taking credit for it. And so all of a sudden we were all getting asked to sit on boards and be a part of different things. And I kept going, no, I, I won't do that. I want that. We exist outside of that. And that is the strength that we've got. So about 18 months into this, Still, things are growing. We're Like I said, we're doing $30 million projects about all of Main Street. Other cities were starting to come to us to, to say, hey, how did you do that? Which is kind of the goal for me is I wanted to create this fertile ground to be able to do all of the things that I wanted to do and then connect all of these different communities together. And around this time, unfortunately for me, I was not only the senior vice president of the construction company and some other stuff, I was also the chief communications officer. And right around this time, this was actually nine years ago to I think February 24th was right when this happened. I started to talk very heavily about robots and AI because I knew it was coming. I was like, oh man, it's starting to happen. Like the curve's coming. So it's a witch again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was too early. I was too, so it's like, so I've, I've learned to temper things. And now I'm at this place, like earlier we were talking about that the change is coming. I, now I'm riding the wave. Before I was like dragging the train. And so I'm publicly talking about robotics and AI. At the time, no one even in the valleys even focused on this kind of stuff. So I'm seen as a complete lunatic in the community. My partners think I've lost my mind because I'm panicking about AI. And like, what are we going to do when AI is all over the place? We need to make sure everyone's included. And they just think I've, they literally think I've snapped. And so I go to our lawyers one day thinking I'm going into to like sign for another property because it was like almost every day we were buying new properties. And I go to sit in my seat and the lawyer comes in and goes, you're in my seat. And I was like, well, where do I sit? He goes over there. And so these lawyers and my partners were all lined up and proceeded to tell me all of the things I was not doing according to the operating agreement. Now, take into account, when we started, there was only three of us. At that point, there was like 100 employees. So none of us were doing the things that were our responsibility in the operating agreement. But I learned a valuable lesson to update and stay on top of paperwork and stuff. If they want to find something, they find right, something. Right? right. So I ended up being going from being worth millions to nothing like in a matter of five minutes. And again, our community is a German Dutch honor culture. And so the way you respond to things, you will be judged. And because I'd help raise a lot of the money and I had relationships with the investors, I would be seen as fighting them, not the company. And so I made the decision that, okay, I'm not gonna fight this. I wanted some kind of buyout and I was like, I'll figure it out later. But right now, I, you know, I can't be worried about that. Now the next day, at, literally the day after this happened, I was supposed to speak something called the Pennsylvania Economic Development Association Spring Legislative Conference. So it's put on by our governor here in Pennsylvania. It's in Harrisburg. People from all across the United States come do it. It's all about economic development. And I had been asked to talk because we were the youngest at the time in the country building the way that we were building, like the speed, millennials building for millennials. It typically was big development companies doing this, not people like us. And so I was supposed to get up and talk about economic development and how we help launch all these businesses. And the night before, I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not talking about that, those guys. And so I drank a bottle of whiskey and rewrote a completely different keynote all about robots and AI. <laughs> like, I'd never done, like, keynotes before. And it's like, I pitched and I was in a band, so lead singer. But I'd never, like, I didn't know what a keynote was even. But I was just so angry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not talking about them. Yeah, but this is fuel sometimes. I mean, for some people, anger is fueling. Right. The one thing I have learned, though, so especially as I've gotten older, so anger, like, that sometimes will drive you. The key is don't let it 
feed you. Overtake yeah, you. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Because like, yeah. then it turns into yeah. vengeance or revenge. And that's like one of those things where it's, I think Gandhi said it, where it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Like, it's just, I've seen how it eats away at people. And I was like, yeah, I, I never want to be like that. And so I'm about to get on stage and I hand them the jump drive and they're like, don't talk about robots. I was like, I'm talking about robots. So you better put that in. So, so they, end, <laughs> they, end up, they end up putting it in. So I get up again. This was an economic development. Like nine years ago, nobody was talking about this stuff. You know, I was supposed to be talking about like the coffee shops we opened and the artist incubator. And so I get up and I'm just like, start talking about robots and AI, showing people what's happening, where it's going. I tied it to a plan that came out of our town in World War II. Needless to say, nobody was prepared, but everyone was terrified. Like you could see people like shaking. The person that introduced me got up and was like, well, that was terrifying. You, know what I mean? <laughs> like, you, could, see, you could hear a pin drop. Yeah, people were hyperventilating. Watch, watch, watch the new Terminator um, right. movie. No? Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, so everybody's freaking out, except for one lady. Her name was Maureen Sharkey. And she came up and she goes, I've never heard about any of the stuff that you're talking about. Would you come to my town and tell that story? And I'm like, sure, I'm unemployed at the time. I think I had like maybe $50 in my bank account. I was like, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. Like, this was the first time I'd ever had money and then had it all taken away. And she said, well, we'll pay you. And I was like, you'll pay me? And she goes, yeah, it's $2,000 enough. And I was like, to talk for 20 minutes? I was like, you're going to pay me $2,000 to get up and talk about robots? And she goes, yeah. And I was like, deal. So I find myself in like, I think it was like maybe Peoria, Illinois or somewhere like this little town and I give the same presentation, terrify everybody there. It's like in an, an old Holiday Inn or something like that. And everyone there is terrified, except for one person comes up and goes, I've never heard about any of the stuff that you're talking about. I run the economic development group two counties over. Will you come talk to us? And I was like, sure, 3,000. Like I just, because I didn't know, I just added another thousand and they're like, but, deal. But you know what? What is really staggering to me is not the fact that you talk about robots in the eye, but it's just nine years ago. I mean, what is nine years? Nothing. Blink of an eye. Yeah, nothing. Yep. And the amount of development we went through in the last nine years. And now by the week, we have more stuff coming up. I mean, this is amazing, amazing part. Oh, yeah. And, but everybody still doesn't know about it. It's interesting. There was something I read recently that something like now, I think it's like 85% of people know what artificial intelligence is. Like now it's like a thing, but something like 5% of them have used it. Just an example, a client of mine, he's a director for a big international bank. And I was talking to him, I was talking about AI and ChatGPT. I said, yeah, I, I want to learn about ChatGPT. Yeah? Can you create a workshop for me? I said, yeah, sure. So I sent him an offer and he forwarded this offer to his procurement department for a ChatGPT crash course, just half a day. Procurement department came back, said... ChatGPT is not in the catalog of training which is authorized for you. So this will be rejected. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and this is 2024, you know? It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So not to derail, but I've seen this pattern of us making things that should be the focus, like hobbies. Like we did it with computer programming, right? When we needed computer programmers, they were after school clubs. By the time now all the kids are learning to code, code is writing itself. By the time it becomes a core, it's not necessary. Same thing with robotics. Like I was pushing to get robotics in regular schools and robotics were like first robotics, like an after school club. And now all of a sudden robotics is like a big core, but now you're seeing things like figure, like humanoid robots and like robots that are figuring things out themselves and like doing things in simulations. And it's like, well, great. Now you're going to teach everyone about robots while the robots can do whatever they want. And like that pattern it, exactly what you just said. Repeating itself all the time. Yep. Yeah. So nine years ago. So think about it now. You're going through that in 2024. Imagine what it was like for me like nine years ago when there was no understanding of any of this. Like I said, people in the Valley weren't even paying attention to this. So basically I ended up getting a, a buyout. I, I can't get too deep into it. It wasn't, it's fine. It wasn't great. But part of my deal was I couldn't do anything in York for two years, at least anything in the same space. I couldn't tap into my old investors. So essentially for two years, I kept like, I would just stumble into speaking engagement after speaking engagement. Like, I didn't know it was a real job. I didn't know. I was so used to getting paid nothing and touring with my band and then having to share that nothing five ways that like getting paid a couple thousand dollars to talk was unbelievable for me. Good deal. But the, the real benefit was for two years, it gave me the ability to crisscross the United States to all these little towns. And I learned how to talk to small town mayors, county commissioners. I started to understand how local government worked, what were the pain points of manufacturers, get to know more manufacturing families. 
So it gave me like kind of a crash course in not just the technology, but in how to communicate it to non-technical people because people weren't trying to do that at the time. Like they were saying things like, oh, well, nobody was talking about AI and robotics and what it was going to do. They were like focused on, okay, well, you need to create a Facebook page. Like things like it, when they talked about tech for business, that's what they meant. You get in a website. Right, right, exactly. Social media, you name it. Now, one of the neat things was, and I said before, like the person asked, can I come? And I was like, yeah, 3,000. Like I just kept doing that before. And then all of a sudden I was getting paid 10,000 every time I spoke. And then the events were getting bigger and larger and, and just more, more gravitas. Till I finally find myself as the main keynote at, I think it was like a 10,000 person event in Seattle. And I was the only person without an agent. Everybody else was represented by Gotham Artists, which is my agent now. And so Alec ended up like delaying his flight so he could watch me because he was like, how the heck did this guy with no agent, I don't know who he is, he gets the main slot. Like the guy before me was the guy that led the team that put the Mars rover on Mars. And then it was like me. There's like nobody from York, Pennsylvania talking about AI and robots. And so I ended up working with Gotham Artists. And then all of a sudden my fee went up 15000 to 20000 25000 and then I was actually a keynote for President Obama a couple times. And then I did something similar for President Trump. I actually taught Vice President Pence to program my robots. I became known as like the technical futurist to rural communities. So like mm -hmm. third tier cities and small communities out in the Midwest, I was the guy. If you wanted to understand how AI and robotics was going to impact your community, I kind of fell into this niche. It was great. And the other cool thing about it is I was actually able to seed fund my robotics company. So through my speaking engagements, that's what I used to seed fund my company. Two years go by, I land my first million dollar contract, my non-compete is up, and then I go back to my old in investors and in an afternoon raise about four and a half million. So then we scale very, very fast. I start to hire engineers from all over the world. I was actually very committed to the educational piece. Like I was convinced that we were going to need less PhDs because again, computer programs were going to write themselves. Computer vision was getting better. Like while we're racing to catch up, we're not going to need any of that stuff. Here we are, right, with, with chat GPT and other generative AI technologies able to do this stuff. <laughs> and, but on the flip side of it is I knew that robots wouldn't go viral. Like robots, we're going to, the demand is going to explode, but it's going to be about how fast can you build, install and maintain, right? Which are the non-sexy parts of tech, right? And so I was like, okay, well, that's the, the fundamental pieces, the building blocks. So I tried to convince our local college to do it and they thought I was nuts. And so out of pure frustration, I actually founded, um, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now, the Fortress Academy. So we're a licensed higher education institution, all focused on accelerated education around AI and robotics, combined with traditional manufacturing skills like welding and electrical, with the goal of creating the first generation of robot mechanics. So blue collar jobs in robotics, that was kind of my thing. I also wanted to do something very large in town and because of my real estate background, I actually ended up taking control of the center of our city. So we were gonna build an innovation district where humans and robots would work side by side. It would be the first place like this. It was focused very heavy on our manufacturing capabilities. In the meantime, I helped raise, I partnered with the YMCA downtown. We raised a little over a million dollars to turn an old bank building into the school. I ended up getting some more money from the state. I got, ended up also mm. getting $6 million from Governor Wolf, our governor at the time, to start building. Was working with a very large defense company that wanted to take like 200,000 square feet of the innovation district. Like It was like literally everything that I've been working on was all coming together. It was, it was astonishing. And people now were starting to, we believed in you the whole time. <laughs> it was that same <laughs> thing I experienced before. And then as soon as all this stuff was happening and coming to a head, pandemic hits. Like literally, mm. like we open the doors mm. for the building, we get the funding, we're going to break ground. And now the company doesn't need space anymore because everybody's working remote. And I had to focus on like, at that point, Pennsylvania, our governor locked everything down. Like, and for mm. us, th the way our business works is we get paid in tranches and big chunks of it happen at install. And we were just sitting on all of these cells and robots we'd built and that couldn't get installed. I didn't know what I was going to do. The other thing is our town, while being a tiny town, I swear to God, everybody thinks they're in Game of Thrones. Like if you've ever seen the show Game of Thrones, it's literally like, like these people like, we got to take this down. And I'm just like, what is happening? We don't have dragons. Like, why is everybody acting like, like this? <laughs> so it was like a full-time job trying to stop people from screwing all my stuff up. But when I had to focus on my company, 
they systematically destroyed everything else. The building, I think, is still empty now. I mean, it's just the Northwest Triangle ended up, my project ended up falling through. Someone else stepped in, still empty. And so I went through like a major depression. My engineers started leaving, like they didn't want to be in York anymore. And so I was, I was really bummed out. Like, I was like, man, what am I going to do? Like, like it literally looked like it was all happening. Like it was like, I swing for the fence, swing for the fence. And it was like, I hit it. And when that happened, and I'm not the only one that went through a depression in the pandemic, obviously. Right. Especially with business people. Like there were people that built multi-generational businesses that just disappeared and so it was just a painful time, I guess, for all of us in the business world. I also lost the business to the pandemic. Really? So, well, I mean, what happened? I, I, don't, I don't want to deviate too much, but I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what happened for you during that? But basically, we've been in a very big project for a client. And due to the pandemic, this project was sort of postponed and postponed and then canceled in the end. And then I had all these people not having anything to do. And we basically, yeah. I'm basically retired from this business at this point. It's rough. Like happens. Uh, yeah, like you said, I saw all my projects disappear and fall apart. It's traumatic. So in all honesty, I'm naturally a very optimistic person and I like to get people excited and that's a strength of mine. But when I was going through that at the time, it was like, it was dragging myself out of bed and you could see like my teams weren't as excited anymore. And I, it was very difficult for me to get excited and so I don't blame them. A lot of them now work at Tesla and SpaceX and other places like that. I had a very young, aggressive team which I made mistakes with because robotics is a mix of advanced technologies and old manufacturing skills. And with computer programming, it's a little different, right? Like you want to get young people with computer programming, but if you do some spaghetti code, you can fix that later. You can't do that when you put a hole in the wrong place or you measure something wrong. And so a big chunk of that, those millions I raised, I lost because I had no idea. I was trying to apply all the stuff from the tech startup into this weird blend of a world. There's just not a lot of robot companies. Even now, there's not a lot of robotics companies. And so what ends up happening is I'm down to just a couple engineers now from like 50. There's just a couple people left. And I'm really bummed out, not really knowing what I'm going to do. And a friend of mine was in Mexico City and getting some money from something called the NIR Foundation. They were a blockchain protocol. And he wanted to set up an extended reality lab and they needed a robotics expert. And I hadn't traveled. The travel ban had just been lifted. And so I was like, all right, well, yeah, I'll come down. I've never been to Mexico City. It seems like a pretty cool place. So I go down and I'm helping him kind of set up this lab. And at night I'm, I'm bored. So I'm on the dating app Bumble. Like I'm just, I'm on Bumble swiping right. And I match with this beautiful Argentinian girl. She's an NFT artist. I mean, she's super talented, amazing. We're still friends. And I was like, man, you're incredible. I was like, I've never met an Argentinian before. I was like, are all Argentinians like you? She goes, yes, we are the best, which apparently is like a thing that our Argentinians do believe. And so I go, really? So it got me thinking, like I came back to York and I obviously only had a couple engineers left and young engineers, again, had burned me. Like they just made mistakes. It's very difficult to find experienced engineers in the robotics world. It's just very, very hard. So I go, all right, I'm going to put one of my most difficult jobs that my teams here struggled with. I'm going to see if I can hire some Argentinians and see how they do. So I put my most difficult job, I think it was like on Upwork or something. The first guy that applies solves the problem in like an afternoon. I was like, get out of here. So I put another difficult job, zero in just in Argentina. The next guy hops on, solves the problem. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And so it turns out Argentinians are like very, very smart. Amazing people. Yeah. yeah. And especially in yeah. engineering. Like they had the world's second largest economy, second largest railroad, second largest dam. Like, and then Peron came in and, but overall, I mean, just very, very creative. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to hire some Argentinians. I got to figure out like how to do this, right? Because again, we're a very physical world. So I started embracing 3D scanning. Like we bought a HoloLens. So we started using augmented reality headsets. So the engineers there could see what my engineers here were doing and drawing over it. Again, I was seeing where all this tech was going. So I was like, all right, I got to figure out how to use all this stuff. So I'm, I'm bringing it together. I ended up going down to Argentina. Like as soon as I hired that first guy, I was like, all right, I need to gain their trust. And so I, I went down, we hiked up in the mountains, spent time with their families. And so now I have a team down in Argentina that works seamlessly with my team here. Again, by embracing like all of those technologies. All of this is starting to work very fast. And while the things in York were falling apart, those seeds I planted during those two years when I was in that non-compete, just traveling around, people were calling me. Because they were, paid off, yes. yeah, they were seeing the mm. things that had happened before. So all of a sudden I was getting asked to go back to all these communities again. So then I started to see like th the demand for robotics beginning to explode everywhere. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to do this like on my own. Like before it was going to be kind of York and we were going to be York centric, but now the demand is exploding. So I started to think, okay, well, how do I duplicate myself so that I could expand at a very rapid rate? I've been experimenting with generative AI very early on. 
And then I started to see like when GPT-3 came out, I was like, it's here. Like all of these like tools and these things that th these exponential curves were all crossing each other. Like they're, they're all starting to, and the interesting thing is I was seeing them cross each other and then begin to carry each other. Exactly. No? They support each other and create more as a result. This is the amazing right, part. Right. And so that drastically shifted even my mindset. So we've been training our own agents and I'm, I'm hoping to work with you on some of this stuff too, because I think this would be a lot of fun is I'm starting to train on how to be an AI to be a project manager and an AI to like do all of our ordering. And the interesting thing is what I've been doing is I've been giving our agents, not just telling them to speak in Spanish, I've been feeding it like Argentinian Spanish because Argentinian Spanish is different than like generic Spanish. So, so it's been great because now I can bring on non-English speaking engineers and they interact with the AI. And so it's like all of these things are just starting to come together And that demand, yeah, the demand for robotics is going to explode. And I, I, we can we can get into like some of the reasons for that. I actually think the pandemic is one of the things that is going to accelerate robotic adoption, especially in the U.S. because Americans' attitudes towards work have changed drastically. Oh, everywhere, right. everywhere. Right. I listened to podcasts this morning where they talked about Gen Z, where young people, and for some of them, work is not the most important factor anymore. Like, like for us, 40 hours a week, oh no, this is too much. This is unhealthy. And I mean, with all the economy going down, people are not interested in work. I mean, we need something like robotics to get the work done. We're going to have to. And so the yeah. interesting thing is, and this is what I try and stress to people, is that because I love people, Like in general, it comes, I guess, from my family's missionary background. Like I can't turn that off. Like I started my robotics company to help people because in the robotics world, it's about how many people can you get rid of? And I'm thinking, how do I do this responsibly? Like responsible disruption. How do I learn the lessons from the last industrial revolutions and not just plow through and make all those same mistakes, which is I wrote a children's book and we'll, we can get into that a little bit later. But, but so I was focused very heavily on creating a robotics company that puts people at its core. And so that's really been my, my big focus. And I try and communicate to people that while they, they're like, I want flexibility, I want more money, I want this, 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 this. And I'm like, you want more, you want to output less at the same time that technologies like robotics and AI are getting better in capabilities and dropping drastically in price. I was like, is nobody connecting the dots that like you're accelerating robotic adoption? You're not you're not making yourself more valuable. And so we're about to hit this crash. Now, that's why it's changed my thinking on instead of focusing just on York, how do I do what I want to accomplish everywhere? Right. Like, how do I figure out how to duplicate myself and do other stuff? AI is the only way to really do it. I've ab abstracted a lot of the difficult things, like the things that I lost a lot of money on. I'm kind of taking out of it. And keeping in a separate entity where the AI lives, the other engineers, the designs, all of these kinds of processes. We're focused very heavily on how do we build cells in a way that I can have people that I train in a very short period of time service, install, and maintain, right? Like, so it's just drastically changed my business. Our profit margins are way higher than industry standards, which is giving me the ability to drop price and undercut. And as we begin to embrace AI, things like the Apple Vision Pro, things that before we were just experimenting with now are becoming seamless, right? And so kind of like we were talking about earlier, it's like there's this curve happening. And for the longest time, I was dragging the train. And now I'm like surfing on top of the train on a tsunami. You know, it's not even a surfboard. It's like enough power to carry the whole train that I was dragging exactly. before. We talked about exponential growth for years. And honestly, I never felt this exponential growth. It never appeared to me that this is exponential. Yeah. But now we are on this tipping point where, boom, every week, every almost every day something else is happening. Yeah? And this is real, the exponential acceleration. Yeah, it's technologies feeding into other technologies. And like, and whenever somebody goes, yeah, but I'm just like, you don't understand what the thing you're looking at means. They're like, they're like yeah, but, but what about battery technology? I was like, but now we're using AI to discover new batteries. Yeah, I mean, there's just, it's like breakthrough leads to other breakthrough leads to other breakthrough. And I don't know that people understand that we're at, it's accelerating returns, right? Like it's a thing that accelerates this thing that now accelerates other things. And so it's a precarious time, right? Because the decisions I think we make in the next five years are going to echo for the next thousand. I mean, they might be like my, my fear before was like, we have haves and have nots. We might actually have haves and have nevers. Like that's a real possibility that that chasm will be so large, so fast that there will be no catching up. And that's just, 
I think about in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, the developing nations, like that's drastically different. Hey, I'd like to make a quick announcement. I've got something exciting to share. As a listener of the High Performance CEO Show, you are already part of a community that values growth, excellence, and pushing boundaries. I created the High Performance CEO Hub, which is a free community where you can connect with me and other listeners, get behind-the-scenes insights, learn how to improve performance and efficiency, and find accountability partners to grow together. Go to www.thehighperformanceceohub.com and join us today. It's free, it's valuable, and it's waiting for you.